Good evening. I'd like to ask everyone to start taking your seats so we can get started fairly promptly. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to see all of you here this evening. My name is Nancy Farrell. I'm with my colleague, Joe Segroy, and we work on outreach for the South Coast Rail Program. And you're going to meet Jean Fox in a minute. She, she directs our, our outreach program very, very ably, I want, might say, without trying to embarrass her. Um, but it's great to have you here. And what we're going to do is give you an update on where the project is now. We have a fairly short PowerPoint that shows you some of the stations and the things that we're working on. And after that, we'll ask you to hold your questions and then after that, we have a microphone down front, and you can come down and um, ask your questions. Um, we look forward to hearing your thoughts as well. And with that, I'll ask Jean to step up. Oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to uh, say we're happy that Mayor Coogan is here. I know I saw him somewhere. Um, oh, there he is. Sorry, there. Great, thank you. And we'll have time at the end for other elected officials who may come um, and for your questions and comments. Jean? Thank you, Nancy. It's certainly wonderful to be back here. We were doing the math on when the last time was we were here, and we were talking about assessments. This is much more exciting. Um, we're now uh, in, a, in a really exciting place with the project, and a lot of the reason for the excitement is the support and input from the community. Um, we've prided ourselves on making sure our community is informed about where we are with the project every step of the way. Many of you receive our weekly e-blasts. Some of you have told us enough already. We have enough information. <laughs> Others have said that they've been very grateful to have that during construction. Uh, construction can always pose its inconveniences, um, but the city of Fall River has lived through much of that for many years, just as recently as the spaghetti ramp project. Uh, and now we're doing the boulevard project, and we've done um, South Coast Rail. Um, so without further ado, I've got my driver, Joe. <laughs> many of you will remember that um, we are extending Middleborough service down to the city of Fall River and also New Bedford and Taunton. Um, that southern triangle piece is what we've worked on. It's active rail. Uh, freight trains have been running along it for years, um, but there's still a lot of work that needed to be done to make it ready for commuter rail service. So the clickety-clack uh, jointed welded rail is gone for continuously welded rail. All new tracks been in, been uh, installed, and we have six new stations. And then at the end of each line um, per MBTA requirements, we have uh, a layover facility. I want to assure you that a layover facility is not a maintenance facility. It's a place where the trains are parked at night and where they leave from in the morning to go on their trips north. Um, there will be cleaning there. Um, and in the winter months when the temperatures are very chilly, um, there are plug-in machines so that we don't have to run the trains to keep the diesel from getting all messed up. So we also have for phase one um, the contract status. The Fall River Secondary Line, as you all know, is substantially complete. We are, however, still working on some punch list items. The larger, the $403.5 million Middleborough Secondary New Bedford Main Line and the systems contract, that construction portion is nearing completion. The final track civilization work are expected to be substantially complete later in the spring. Um, the automatic train control and positive train control systems testing and commissioning on all lines will continue through this spring. Um, and then after that, we have operational qualification field training, and then the Federal Railroad Administration requires a simulated service demonstration. So that is operating trains successfully over a period of time, uh, but without passengers. So they have to operate on the schedule, they have to find their way into South Station, they have to find their way through the pinch point. It's how you fine tune the schedule. That is required by the FRA. Um, the off-site traffic mitigation project is um, pretty much done. I think you guys will get a kick out of this. We went and ordered the trailblazing signs. Those are usually purple. 
Um, but right when we were ready to go put our trailblazing signs in, the rules changed, they have to be green. So the signs you see on this slide are what will direct people in the city to the station. Um, and just for future reference, if you wanted to know why we couldn't do purple, that's only for easy pass. Who knew? So um, the, the off-site mitigation was largely work uh, around station areas, intersections, things like that. Um, they've done a lot of work. They did the President Avenue an area where the D'Angelo sign is. They did work in um, Taunton and Middleborough, some signal work in Lakeville. Um, they did a good job. They're about done. Just have to put those signs up. So um, the, the New Bedford Ped Bridge is another um, piece of this puzzle. Uh, it's, it's under construction right now. We have the false work up, so when you're driving on Route 18 or Cushnet Avenue in the city, you'll see what looks like a really awful looking bridge. Don't panic, that's not it. That's to hold the bridge, the final bridge, once it's erected. Um, and it's going to be, as you see in the, uh, the graphic there, a tide arch bridge. We worked tirelessly with the city of New Bedford on this design. And this will get people safely across Route 18 and Acushnet Avenue. It will also probably help serve the Sea Street Ferry Service um, downtown over to um, the area where the ferry parking is. Uh, this, this bridge will also boast some local artwork and in the final analysis will be owned by the city of New Bedford. The Fall River Station also shows some of the um, amenities that we have for every station. This is a side platform station, a typical MBTA commuter rail station, 800 foot platform, 100 foot roughly canopy, all the signage, bike parking, um, benches, stairs, ramps, uh, EV plug-ins, um, and, and essentially that, that's what a side platform station looks like. And you'll see when we get to Taunton in a, in a couple of slides, it's a little different. Um, you can see on the next slide the schematics of what our, our, our crews went in with and what it looks like in the end. It looks fantastic. Um, the ramp that leads from Pierce Street into the uh, station is covered, so people who get off the bus on Main Street and walk down the street can get onto the ramp right into the station uh, area, the, the ramp area, to the uh, platform. Now, East Taunton is a little different. Um, it's a center island platform. So it has tracks on both sides. Um, that means you need multiple modes of access and egress. So it has elevators, it has ramps, it has bridges. Um, it has a lot of complexity. So that station is not done yet. Uh, all the other stations, as I've mentioned, are, are mostly complete. Certainly on Fall River, that's the case. On the New Bedford line, the stations on that end are very close to complete. This one still has a little ways to go. But it's coming along. There's a lot of um, concentrated effort at that station to make it ready for passengers, and that will be continuing for the next couple of months. The uh, Freetown station looks a lot like the New Bedford station, and it's only a few miles down the road. Again, it has the similar amenities. All of the stations will have um, a lot of lighting and a lot of cameras for security. Um, and then, again, the EV parking, handicap parking. Next slide, Joe. So here we have, um, are we in Church Street? Oh, Middleborough, I skipped Middleborough. I can't do that. <laughs> Middleborough's another side platform station looking really good. Uh, we've had a few site visits out there. Uh, it's gonna have a direct connection from 495 into the station, which is nice. I will say that's true in Taunton too. I forgot to mention that. Taunton um, is doing a huge interchange project, 140-24, and then one of the ramps off 24 will be a dedicated ramp into the station parking area. So now I can go to Church Street. Church Street and New Bedford stations are about 99% complete. What you're seeing in this photo is old. Uh, the canopy roof is on now on Church Street. They're doing some final uh, conduit work. Um, a very little, uh, I think a, an LCD screen has to go into one of them. Minor stuff, mostly punch list. And then they'll have to get all the inspections. Um, so critical items for uh, revenue service. Uh, no, New Bedford, it was, oh yeah, see, he printed two on one sheet, I'm confused. <laughs> New Bedford, again, is similar, side platform, but it's right next to the Sea Streak Ferry, so that's going to be wonderful. Um, we're sharing the parking with Sea Streak, and, um, and then the bridge will connect directly over to the New Bedford station as well. So, what do we need to get this thing rolling? 
the East Taunton station, as we mentioned, needs to be completed. And we have automatic train control testing. So what is automatic train control? It basically sends signal indications to the train cab in addition to using physical signal lights that you see outside. These signals are part of the positive train control system and alert the engineer of any potentially unsafe condition. There are some 2,000 tests required for that. Get to positive train control, all of you will recall, not that many years ago, the federal government came down on, on across the country and said everybody has to have positive train control for safety. It's a monitoring system that alerts the engineer when there is a, either a train to train potential collision or if it's going too fast in a certain area or if it should be entering a construction zone and it should slow down. And if the crew doesn't respond, the positive train control takes over. So this came in light of a number of pretty horrific uh, train accidents. Um, and this is the fuel system transponders, a way to alert each individual train uh, what's going on and helps take control if there is something dangerous uh, down the tracks. Fire life safety training. Um, we also have to do safety certification of some 200 safety elements. So every bridge, every culvert, every grade crossing, all the walls, all the tracks, all the stations, all the layovers, and the equipment have to be safety certified. And then we'll have the operational qualification field testing that will allow our locomotive crews to understand the route. And then we also have to commission all that equipment for service. Then we have to do the one I mentioned before, the simulated service. After that, successful implementation and run, we'll be ready for revenue service. And MBTA Railroad Operations is the lead on rail activation and on getting passengers on these trains. I wanted to update you on where we are with construction, but I want to go to the next piece that is critically important to all of us in this room, and that's safety. Um, this past weekend, we had a vehicle enter the right of way at the Tipsy Toboggan and drive 1.7 miles on the railroad tracks over to Melos Chorizo. Now, if a train had been on those tracks, those people wouldn't be here. They probably thought it was a fun thing to do. It could have been an error, but you have to stay off the tracks. We're gonna have fast running test trains in this area very soon. And they're gonna be running in some areas at speeds up to 79 miles an hour. You are used to 10 and now 25 mile an hour sporadic freight traffic. You are not accustomed to commuter rail locomotives traveling at fast speeds. We have been blessed to have been able to use the right of way to walk the dog, to go take a little walk in the woods. You can't, you can't do it. If you can deliver that message safely, I would appreciate it, but I'm also available to help deliver that mes message uh, elsewhere. Um, I will say that when those test trains are running, all of the um, grade crossings will be functioning with signals and gates. Fall River doesn't have any grade crossings, but I know you drive outside of Fall River. So if you're going into Freetown or Berkeley or Taunton or New Bedford, there are grade crossings. Um, and we ask you to heed all those lights and signals. Um, we have a program called Safety First that the outreach team has put together and the MBTA has adopted as a, as a great way to get the, the uh, safety message out. So we've done targeted emails, uh, we targeted schools, communities, sportsmen, ATV users who now are out and about. And by the way, if you're on an ATV and a train is on the tracks, you're not gonna hear the, the train coming. Um, we have a lot of brochures, we brought some today. We got a grant from Operation Lifesaver, so we were able to secure a lot of materials that we are distributing. And um, our information has been adopted again by the entire MBTA um, for a commuter rail safety website um, that you're welcome to visit. Um, we also have um, been giving uh, presentations in schools, uh, community groups, and we're happy to do more of those. Um, the messaging has to be very clear. Um, we are encouraging everyone to read these flyers and understand the dangers of being near the right of way, particularly in Fall River where there are so many areas where the right of way is extremely narrow 
that even if he did hear a train coming, he probably wouldn't have much leeway to move. Um, so that, that's an important message, and I don't mean to be somber about it, but I'm very concerned that um, we are still seeing people trespassing, and it is trespassing. It is illegal to be on the right-of-way. Again, over 60 years, we were able to enjoy it without <laughs> worrying about risk to life and limb, but that is not going to be the case in very short order. Um, and then again, the test trains are going to start. I can't give you a date certain on that, but they are definitely uh, coming this spring. Again, they can go up to 79 miles an hour. Please keep in mind that the only safe place to cross train tracks is at a designated pedestrian or, or railroad ra roadway crossing. Any signals you see, pay attention to them. Uh, we used to see signals all the time, but there were no gates. We didn't see a train. You go plowing through. Can't do that anymore. Um, they're quieter, too. The other thing about these trains is they're push-pull locomotives. So the locomotive will go one way, and then the engineer goes to the other end of the train to a cab, and the locomotive pu pushes it out. So that's all great, except it makes it really hard to figure out which way it's going. Really, really hard to figure out which way it's going. So I encourage you also to look at some of the videos that we made for Safety First. They're age appropriate, so we have an elementary school one, we have a middle school one, we have a high school one, and a general public one. And it explains the difficulty of understanding uh, the directional piece of where the train is and how it's so difficult to hear, because it is quieter than you think. Um, and again, please don't hunt, please don't fish, please don't use your snowmobile or your ATV or your dirt bike. It's not a recreational area, it's a dangerous area. Um, so I'm happy to see some public safety in the room today. He brought his wife too. <laughs> and um, we worked very closely with you on the drill we did in July in Freetown. Um, we meet quarterly with the fire life safety team to go over concerns uh, for first responders. Again, where you have not seen traffic in this area for so many years, this is new to your first responders. And the last thing they want to do is be unable to respond appropriately to any rail emergency, whether it's somebody getting hit in a grade crossing or a derailment or anything. <clears throat> and they've already worked with the local freight operator, Mass Postal, so they have some knowledge of trains, but these drills really help them understand what you need to do to rally and, and get people off and say it's a mass casualty event. Get them off, get them triaged, get them taken care of. Um, and I will say that the, the one in Freetown and the subsequent one in November in New Bedford, very well attended. Uh, we came out of that with after action reports so that all the departments see where things went really, really well and where they could use some tweaking. Um, so I think that that was good. And we're going to offer some additional training to first responders. Um, they express loud and clear to us that they're very excited about the train coming, but their first priority is saving people. Um, so we want to work with them. We're, we're, we're targeting May right now, just so you know, to get that additional hands-on. Um, so we had, we had very good results uh, from those two drills. Uh, the MBTA does at least one drill annually, but it could be anywhere uh, in the system. Uh, we did two down here because it's so new for our region. Um, and community outreach, my, a lot of my team is here, and I've got others here from the team that I work with uh, every day uh, to get this project, to see it over the finish line. Uh, please reach out to us at any time. Again, we do meetings with community groups. We're doing another one next week. Yes. Um, and we are getting into some schools. Uh, we want to continue to do that. And our weekly updates, we have over 6,000 people that get those. Um, as we get into this next phase of testing and commissioning, you will not see as much activity as you've seen over the course of four and a half years of very active construction. Because the testing and commissioning is kind of behind the scenes. It's not as visible. You don't have a lot of heavy equipment. What you have is people testing all these little components to make sure they all work well together. Because in the final analysis, the Federal Railroad Administration Railroad operations and our operator, Keolis, will not let a train run unless they are 150% certain it's ready to run, ready to run safely and reliably. That's where we are at today. That's why I can't tell you exactly when we're going to have revenue service. We have a new team in our leadership 
that is really doing a deep dive right now to make sure the testing and commissioning goes as well as possible. If there's any way we can claw back, we will. But we are looking now at, at, at least through the spring into the summer doing a lot of work and we will have updates for you uh, in the coming weeks. So I'm going to invite Nancy up. So we do have the videos that Jean referenced on the website, and the address is up there, <coughs> mbga.com. Uh, I always forget it. <laughs> Me too. Slash project slash South Coast Rail. So there's one for every age group, kids, middle school, high school, and then the general public. And I think they're really practical and down to earth. So um, watching them, children, um, people who don't know anything about trains can learn a lot. So I would, I would encourage you. And if you'd like us to come to your neighborhood, club, or whatever, as Jean said, we'd be happy to come and, and have a conversation. So I am going to see if there are, um, Mayor, would you like to say anything at this point? Or Okay. Are there any other elected officials here? I'm sorry, I can't see well with, with the light. Who would like to say something? Yes. Would you, could you come to the... Okay. <laughs> we we great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Any other elected officials, counselors? All right. If not, then if there's do you have any comments or questions? Um, uh, yes. Would you like to come to the microphone? Oh, oh sorry. We could have brought it to you. Sorry. Uh, do you need information from me in oh, terms you can of... Just say who you are and then... Uh, uh, Joe Cavallo. Hi, Joe. Lower River resident. So uh, I have several areas of concern. Okay. Uh, the first one is the MBTA is currently 1,088 workers short. That's one concern. Okay. Uh, the Boston Business Journal... Uh, did a poll that showed that uh, the current rails, commuter rail service was rated as a C with grades of A, B, and C. Uh, Keolis the, uh, is going to be operating the commuter rail. Yeah. They don't have a great history in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, and the Act on Mass, which is a nonprofit organization uh, that takes no corporate contributions, estimated on February the 15th of this year that the current debt of the MBTA is 7.62 billion with a B dollars. So my 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 thought is, what's the cost going to be? When are these positions going to be filled? I mean, you did an article in today's Standard Times, Gene, that talked about safety, and I applaud that. However, uh, we've had so many difficulties with the MBTA, the, the commuter rail, the, the, the subway system, the, the T in Boston, uh, even, even a fatality. So I, I think that people need to know exactly what the answers are to these concerns. And uh, if I could, also, the, the idea that uh, weekend service has been, there's almost like a whisper campaign that we may or may not have weekend service. Uh, so, uh, and, and what's the cost gonna be, specifically? So, if you would. Uh, yep. Thank you. <laughs> All good questions, Joe. Thank you. Um, the MBTA is under new leadership right now. I think you all know uh, Phil Eng took the helm quite a while ago. And it was a tall order for him. Uh, we, the, no secret that the uh, focus has been largely on the subway system, and it definitely needed that focus. Uh, I don't think anybody questions that. 
and it seems like they get rid of you know six slow zones and another five show up. Um, so there is a focus on that. There's also a legislative focus to make sure the T has uh, more adequate funding. We have years of neglect that have to be made up now, and I believe General Manager Ang has that as a top priority. In terms of commuter rail in the grade of C, since the pandemic, commuter rail in the Commonwealth is actually uh, over 92 or 93 percent to pre-pandemic levels and is, is quite reliable. So the reliability of commuter rail continues to be quite remarkable and will continue is my expectation. But that's why you do the simulated service. You need to make sure that our trains coming up from Fall River meeting the Plymouth and everybody else at the pinch point in Braintree can navigate that single track and get into South Station successfully. Um, so there's still more work to do, and Keolis is, is under a tight rein right now, um, but we've also been working very closely with them on this project. Um, I feel very comfortable that they are more than happy to take the reins here and extend this service. In terms of our hiring, they're already hiring the engineers we need for South Coast Rail. They're, they know what they need. We need 100 people to operate, we're doing, we're adding two train sets to what exists. So 24 trips a day right now on the Middleborough line will extend to 26. We need 100 people for that. So that's already underway. Uh, and that training is fairly comprehensive, so you can't just hire them the day before you uh, operate service. So that's underway. Um, the debt is not, I can't address that. I, I think it's a big problem, but I remember four years ago somebody putting out a nine billion dollar figure. Um, so it's something I know the MBTA has to has to wrestle with, and that they are wrestling with, and the legislature is as well. But the bottom line is we deserve this billion dollars. That a billion dollar investment in our region we waited a long time for, and to get people the connectivity to Boston so they don't have to sit on Route 24 is worth it. I know that. Whenever you build something, something else gets pushed aside or shoved aside. But in the final analysis, you put trains in, you, you spur economic development, you catalyze change. I feel very positive about that. Weekend service. I get that all the time. Right now, there's weekend service on the Middleborough line. I would expect it to happen. But again, that's a different department. They're still working on the schedule. Uh, and they're still working on the fares. I, I wish I could tell you that right now. I don't know what zone we are, um, but I do know that we've made it clear people want the weekend service, and it would make sense, because not everybody's going to commute. And that was the thing that uh, Ryan Caholan said the other day. Not everybody is commuting on commuter rail. It could be a misnomer. Um, some people go to health appointments or school or theater. There are other things to do on the train to get you back and forth safely. So. I hope that helps. I, I can't answer everything, Joe, but I feel confident that Keolis knows what we're doing here. They were at our drills. They watched what we did. They did teach some of the things we did, and they worked very closely with railroad operations. And railroad operations, again, won't let trains run until they're absolutely confident that those trains can run safely. Uh, yes, um, my name is Nelson Vasquez, Fall River resident. I too have some concerns. Uh, not too long ago, uh, New Bedford threatened a, uh, a lawsuit over the uh, price dispute over the land purchase back in 2019. Yep. And he referenced the point that at that time, uh, they wasn't part of the NBTA service district and, and didn't become officially a part of it back into just two years ago in 2018 yes. with the vote. Uh, it turns out that Fall River is in that same boat because the Vol Street, uh, you guys purchased a parcel of land uh, March of March 29th of 2019. Uh, the parcel value at that time was assessed at $80,800. And the sales price in, this, in the city of Fall River was the seller for this parcel. Uh, that it was purchased for a dollar. And whenever there's a price dispute, whenever something like this comes up in court, the NBTA's uh, rebuttal to that is that they always pay fair market value for whatever land they purchase. Mm -hmm. So paying $1 is not fair market value for a price of land that was $80,000, and today is over over 100000 So 
you probably won't have the question, but I feel that on the way to the ribbon cutting ceremony, I feel that th that the, the residents of Fall River should be paid what's owed because paying one dollar is again is not fair market value, and just like how the same arguments New, New Bedford weighed is that we wasn't part of the service district. Mm -hmm. And before you start building all of this, you have to ask the community first as you know, if they want to join or not. If they say yes, then you start building. So that's another can of worms that I'm not going to get into. But the thing is, is that the city is owed money for this parcel of land. And I feel that the NBTA should do right by, by the residents and pay what's What's, what's, what's old? Are you referring to the Weaver's Cove site? Uh, this is at uh, DeVos Street. It's right next, to, uh, right next to that plaza. right. Oh, there. where the parking is. Yeah. So it's, and the thing is, is that, again, nice presentation. You know, I want to commend everyone for putting the time in building that. But I feel like, you know, again, if, if we're going to do business, uh, you got to pay, you got to pay what's old. Well, I will tell you that the process for acquiring properties is, is pretty rigorous. Um, there's an appraisal done and a review appraisal. And offers are made, and there's frequently some back and forth that happens with it. Um, so we didn't get any protests when we took those properties. Uh, yeah, um, I get that. At, at, at that the time, time, the issue didn't come New up. Bedford's a little different uh, because there was a um, concern that we had not adequately compensated the city for the property, which was a brownfield. Um, so w we do feel that the in the end, and I believe the city's synced up with us on this, that this is a good thing for the city. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing for that parcel of land. There's only certain things you can do on some parcels. So Weaver's Cove was a primary spot, perfect spot, for us to put the layover facility because of the Shell Oil history there, right? So, so that made sense, too. Uh, I can't answer what the value is, I'd be interested if you wanted to share your documentation, I could take you to real estate, the, the whole real estate department that does all that. Um, but and they again, do go through quite the process. And again, this is, you know, this is city furnished documents and it yep. has the, all of the previous years of, uh, of the assessments, uh, assessments and, yep. and it says it, the date, the price. And again, you know, um, I know you wasn't going to have the answer, but no. the thing is, is that now that this is going to be uh, now that New Bedford is going to make the news with that, I'm pretty sure, I don't know if it's been rectified. Mm -hmm. And again, people are going to look into this as public record and they're going to bring it up. Sure. And, um, and again, I just feel like, you know, a lot of work went into this. Mm -hmm. I don't want a bad taste to go into stuff like this to come up. No, you know we what don't. I mean? well, obviously we don't either, but that would be our real estate group that would yeah. deal with that. So we can certainly elevate it to them. If you want to leave your name with us and we could contact you, um, we appreciate you bringing that point up. Um, we certainly didn't come in to rob everybody. No, we no, no, no. came in I'm not, I'm with not strategic plans about where to put stations. We, we bought out no. businesses there. I, I, I just want to be clear. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not making the, uh, uh, I'm not assuming you guys came in to rob. That's not no, what I'm saying. No, it's and that, that was a poor choice of words. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's further from the truth is that Agreed. stuff like this is going to come up. Yep. And it's just that when you have information like this readily readily available, um, it's it's in pure black and white. And, uh, no, and again, you know, and also good. too, real quick, the level of debt that's facing the NBTA, what's coming down, um, we all know that this type of uh, transportation system requires ridership. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give you a, a quick uh, question I think you can answer. What happens if this city does not have, does not meet the ridership that you guys need to keep this afloat every single year? That will be something that will have to be studied by railroad operations and Keolis. Um, I'm willing to bet, uh, no, I'm not gonna bet. I am confident that people are gonna get on this train because if you do 24 every day, you're never gonna wanna do it again. And um, and see, people know what I'm talking about. No, I get about. that. No, I get that. It's, it's not, and we deserve to have no, another that. way to get into the city. I don't think on day one our trains are going to be bursting at the seams. It's going to take time for people to acclimate. Also, we're seeing activity, um, people moving out of the greater Boston area down towards our region because we ha still have some affordable housing here, which is certainly not the case. Um, and then we also will have students. We had, over the years, we've heard from so many kids, oh, I got into MIT, I got into UMass Boston, I got into Suffolk, but I can't live in Boston. Yeah. 
I can't live even outside of Boston. I want to be able to get there. So we'll see. I think there's a reciprocal piece to it, too. I do think you'll see people coming out of Boston to see what we have here. Yeah, and I'm just voicing the concern of the community. I, and yeah, I appreciate Because they are, they are, that's one of the questions they're asking. Yep. They're not getting answers. So, yeah. and like you said, that's one side of the coin, but there is another side. Absolutely. This thing requires ridership, and they just want to know yeah. if it doesn't have it, what happens then. Right? Yep. Thank um, you. That won't be an issue. Well, let's, let's hope not, but uh, at least if we can have that answer, that would be greatly appreciated. Yes. Thank you. And I appreciate your questions. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Oh, I see you got one of the books. Yeah, the books. I got one. Yep. So my name is Kelly Arruda, and I'm a city resident, and I'm really excited about the train. My question is, is uh, my office is located centrally in Boston, so I'm excited to be able to jump on the train. So my question is, um, how long is the train ride from either New Bedford and Fall River to Boston, or how many stops, and how much will a fare cost me? Thank you. All good questions, thank you. Um, it's about an hour and a half ride um, from the terminal cities of Fall River and New Bedford. Don't know what it's going to cost yet because they haven't determined what zone we're in. I know they're working on it. I heard from them two weeks ago. We're still working on it. They're trying to make sure they can give us the best service possible for the best price, uh, but that's a separate department. Um, but I, I think they are working on some um, fair packages for people. They've just announced recently um, that they're going to have more um, lower, reduced fares for low-income people, and they already do for some students. So there are things out there. Just stay tuned. <laughs> Thank you. I often <clears throat> have gone to Lakeville to take the train, and those trains make an enormous number of local stops every few yeah. miles. Will the Fall River and New Bedford trains all make all those stops, or will, can there be some express services? Yeah, that's a question we get a lot. Um, it, if they look at scheduling, they might, they've talked about potentially doing the two shoulders, the, the earliest and the latest train not stopping everywhere, but they haven't worked that out yet. Otherwise, yes. They will stop at all the stations. Not too attractive. <laughs> They're quick. They stop, then they go. Hi. Hi. My name is James Smith. I have a, <clears throat> I have a question regarding the layover facility mm -hmm. and the condition that it's in. I walk around a lot. I was there yesterday. Yep. And the street in front of it the sidewalk is half taken up with debris. There's leaves, there's junk. The fence is in terrible condition. There's a nice iron fence there from when the St. Vincent's home was here. And I saw a section of it was painted black and it looks nice, but then the rest of it's uh, other type of fencing. Some of it's kind of falling down. Yeah. Um, it needs landscaping. What's the what's the plan for that? So we they have punch list work and part part of it's cleaning up on the fence. I actually um, contacted the Bristol County Sheriff's crew to do the painting. The fence does not belong to the MBTA. It belongs to the city. The wrought iron fence, that beautiful fence, but the sheriff's office has agreed to paint it. But when they started, we started with torrential downpours. So they're coming back at the end of the month. They've scheduled, I think, the 29th and the 30th mm -hmm. to come back and uh, try to finish it. Because it, it, it it, the facility itself looks nice. It does. It, it, I agree. Yeah. Um, we had we had MON, the landscaping folks, in several months back to do some cleanup. They'll have to come back again. Okay. And the second question is, no overnight parking at any of the parking facilities? You know, I don't know. Because I parked overnight in Lakeville and... That wasn't a problem, but I think I think if you I think if, do you guys know either of you, Bob or Holly? I don't, I don't think it's a lot. I don't either. I'm thinking it's not, but I know if you well, that's we'd have if to you get back go on that. To Boston for a weekend, park yeah, there and go up. I, and that's exactly right. I, I think there are, are some circumstances where you can, but that still have to go to the parking people to figure out. And I'm out. sorry, the last question just came to my mind. The, the numerous cameras there, will mm -hmm. the local police departments be able to monitor those? What's going to happen with those is that their MBTA monitors first. Same thing with the blue boxes that you see at the stations, okay. and then they dispatch. Um, and that's why we are working very closely with first responders. We don't want any lag time. We want people to know that 
this call is going in here and somebody's got to answer it there. All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Hi, Jean. Hi. Cheryl Montero, I live in Taunton. Um, he just brought up a question I was going to, I just want to add to so the security cameras. It's the MBTA manning them. Are they manning them 24 seven? I believe so. I mean, they, they have to run 24 seven. Mm -hmm. Yes, because I know right where you live too, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and your concern is the stations right on the other side of your backyard. Mm -hmm. And you're concerned that, that you could have intruders. Right, yes. exactly. Yes. Um, the timing of the trains, if there's 24 or 26 trains yep. going in each direction, are they going at the same time and and landing at each station at the same time? Or is it one train going up and then one train coming back? Do you know, Bob? Yeah, there's a train going both directions, but they have... But they have different, they're staggered. Going on the other direction. So yeah, it could we be every 15 minutes, too. not every half an hour. Pardon? It could be every 15 minutes, not every half hour. Oh, it really, yeah, that, that will be the final schedule. I can't tell you that right now, I'm not sure. And uh, we had asked before, and you had said they were not going to be blowing the horn when they come into the station. Is that still true? That was what I was told about that station. They'll do they'll do uh, along the way. Bob, do you have an answer for that? They will have to stop the horn if they cross Henry Street. That's right, where, right where you are. <laughs> and they, I believe they hit the bell at the station. Yeah, they just do the bell at the station, but you are close enough to that um, County Street 140 crossing mm -hmm. there. Um, they will they will definitely sound the horn there. But worse if it goes into the station. Sorry? He said the bell will ring at the, the bell, station as well. The bell, but not the horn. How loud is the bell? Um, it's a ding ding. If you watch one of the videos, you'll hear one because they do have, it's not bad. It's not like the horn. Okay, that's all I have, thank you. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for coming. Hi, my name is Robert Lecter Moy. I lived in Middleborough for nearly 20 years. I lived in Brockton. I grew up in Brockton. And I know you people from when I was in Cambridge working on transportation issues there. In response to the question of parking, mm -hmm. we, call, we call it in on the computer. We can schedule it for multiple days. That's what I did. Yeah. I didn't have a problem That's with fine. that. But I wasn't sure if we were doing that all over. Good. Thank you for that. <laughs> I lived in Brockton when the train went in. Yes. Before I went on the train, I took the bad line to get to Boston. And the strongest supporters of commuter rail were the former bat riders <laughs> who moved to commuter rail. I'm also, I have two years experience as a railroader. When we were talking about railroaders on working the lines, a key question is qualification. Yes. That is on existing lines, so I presume there's the people who are deadheaded and learning the road and that tested on the knowledge of the road. Yes. Yes. I would think that you're going to have a lot of people deadheading who are actually riding the road, learning the road, and who are then tested for qualification. Absolutely. It's a rigorous process. Uh, with my experience, I would think you're not looking at one key source of traffic. The biggest customers on the existing line now are Brockton and Bridgewater. Mm -hmm. And I would not be at all surprised to see the same people going to South Coast. And Jeb, you're building up capacity, you're building up interest. We are. I think it's an excellent idea, and I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, Robert. And I remember you from many, many meetings, so thank you for coming to Fall River.
Yes, hello. Um, my name is Shannon Avery Damaris, and I live in Swansea. Um, so first of all, thank you very much for the work that you've done on this, of your whole team, because this has created an opportunity for me to take a position in Boston, which I'm very excited about. So, um, and really the, the fact that I have accessibility to the train factored into that decision. So I know you can't give me a specific date, but my job starts on July 8th. So I'm wondering if no. I might, <laughs> if I might be, you know, on a train in the fall maybe, or are we're, we talking we're trying. 25. You know, um, this testing and commissioning is so huge. I wish I could give you an answer today. I can probably tell you July is unlikely. Yes. Can you yeah. put it off a little? Yeah, bit? yeah. <laughs> so maybe 2025. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we have incredible new leadership now that have come in to do because this is technical. This isn't just this isn't civil anymore, and not just putting in platforms and parking lots. This is very technical. And also remember, PTC is a fairly new technology. So there are only so many people who are really good at it. And there is only so many vendors that have the right stuff to sell you for it. So we're working in that narrow stream in an environment that says railroad safety has to be paramount. And I guess maybe in the past it wasn't. When we first scheduled this whole construction, we banked two to four months for testing and commissioning. Because back in the day, that's what it was. No longer. And for the right reasons. Yeah. So FRA is watching us closely, but, but uh, Keolis and railroad operations are as well. These new people doing their deep dive, I'm hoping in the coming weeks we'll have a little better handle on when we can expect to see you on a train to your new job in Boston. Yeah. Um, so testing could take like well, a month, year, it could potentially. Take Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, my other question is um, about timing of yeah. when um, the trains might start running. So obviously Boston is a huge medical mecca. Um, yes. Those of us in healthcare start very early. So, um, and that has been um, in the past uh, um, a hindrance to me driving to Lakeville sure. or something like that to take the train there. So I'm wondering sure. if the trains are gonna get there in time for those of us who start at, you know, 7, seven 7.30. Yeah, well, we call it the nurse's train actually. <laughs> I'm um, a nurse practitioner. <laughs> So thank you. No, we, there's still a nurse's train because we know we have to get everyone up to Longwood like quickly and for that first shift. So you know, typically run on the earliest train. I can't tell you exactly what time, but that train is definitely in the mix. You're welcome. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Robert Grantham and from the city of uh, Fall River. I'm very excited about it. I'm very supportive of it. Um, I understand these sort of projects have financial details technical details that have to be worked out. But overall, I'm very excited about the project and I think it's good for the city of Fall River. Um, one of the things that I'm sort of excited about is being able to go to the airport. Um, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how sort of exhausted I am with going to the airport. It's horrible. And so when you mention about possibly not having weekend service, no, <laughs> don't, don't go there. So far there is weekend service. Our guess is they're gonna take the existing schedule and expand it down to the two terminal cities. Right, and so the other question I have, and I don't even know if you can answer this question, in terms of the vision of all of this, mm -hmm. and I see that Fall River has like a depot station, and oftentimes at the end of the line you have an actual station. Yeah. Like when you go to Lowell, you go to Worcester, yeah. of course you go to South Station. And I don't know if you guys have been in any conversations with the city of Fall River or where this thing is headed in terms of the vision, whether it's going to ultimately become a destination with shops and restaurants. It could. <laughs> you, you raise a good point, and, and it's a zoning point, okay. right? So if they zone around a station um, for mixed use or residential or do that kind of planning, you can see some great development like that. And an actual station, I, I was actually told that this is a misnomer to call these stations. They're just platforms. They're glorified platforms with covers on them, um, which is accurate. I can't deny that. But that's what we do in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for commuter rail service, right? Were those conversations, did those conversations ever happen about depot versus a station? Or so so the depot is named because we had a Fall River Depot station here back in the day, okay. which was a brick and mortar building. Um, that it's a, it's a beautiful photograph we have somewhere of it, but um, that's not what we're building today. If the city envisions change that fits a building or a nearby structure, for example, then the city is at liberty to work with the MBTA, assuming they want to come up to the property and do stuff. I will say that Taunton is looking at, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, four buildings, transit-oriented development, residential structures right next to the station. 
okay. which will be transformed in potentially a coffee shop. So, <laughs> so those are joint decisions. Yes. In BTA and the city. If you're if you're abutting our property, um, or say for example, they do a traffic impact study and you're introducing 1,000 new residents at the same time, we have all these people coming out of the stations. You have to work collaboratively, as we have done all along the way with all of the road work projects that are going on here in the city. We've been in all those meetings. We continue to attend those meetings so that we don't put something in that's going to mess up the 79 project or anybody else. So those conversations, I would encourage um, folks that want to see more of that kind of conversation approach the city council too um, on everything from transit-oriented development to a bigger station. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Alan Rougeau from Fall River. Um, very pleased to see this is uh, occurring. Um, I was advocating with Governor Weld uh, in oh, the day. That, you know, so just, sue me, right? We were supposed to get it right <laughs> away. You know, but anyway, um, but uh, I do have a concern, and I just want to express it. And I don't know what the answer is. I wish I did. Um, but as a as a resident of Fall River for you know most of my life, uh, my childhood, I grew up playing on the tracks. Don't. Right, I know. And this is, uh, so like, I, I don't know, I guess kids don't really play outside that much anymore, but but my life, both in the north end and the south end, I mean, it was, you know, fishing, it was getting into the, getting to the water. Uh, I don't really, I mean, so this is just an expression of concern, mm -hmm. right? I don't know how we're going to keep people from going to the shoreline you know, from, from residences. Um, and I don't know what the answer is, um, but, that's, but at 80 miles an hour, uh, that's, that's kind of like a significant kind of, of, of travel rate, you know? So uh, I'm glad you're coming, because believe it or not, I, I came from the State House today and I tried to leave early. It How's doesn't make a difference. You? It does not make no, a it difference. Trust me. I, <laughs> I mean, oh my God. So I'm glad you're coming, but that is something I don't thank know. You. I, I really, you're absolutely right, and we are very concerned that people are going to try to cross the tracks to get from point A to point B. But remember, the Route 79 project is going to open up a lot more pedestrian access to the waterfront. Hopefully, will, people will take the crosswalks and not the train tracks. Thank you for your question. Hi, my name is Steve Kobe Elker. I live in Fall River. Mm -hmm. um, I've been riding the MBTA, uh, well, when I started, it cost a nickel. Oh. Okay? And I've been riding commuter rail for a long time. I retired to Fall River about 11, 12 years ago. So I'm looking forward to this. But um, there's a couple of things that concern me. Mm -hmm. One is this credibility issue. Mm -hmm. I was a big fan of this project. And a year or so ago, we were told in a meeting similar to this what the fares would be, what zone we would be in, approximately, from us. approximately what parking would cost. We would be the furthest zone out from the system. We were told that I, that it would be number nine. Um, I'm, I'm not making this stuff up. And we were told that this project would be coming in last autumn. The, yes. Okay. Now, those kind of details I'm aware of because I was very interested. Mm -hmm. Now I find these details are no longer there. We yeah. don't know what zone it's going to be. We're not sure what the fair is going to be. We don't know when it's going to start. And this sounds rather bureaucratically typical of when a time estimate fails, because now you back off and you don't want to make any commitments. But I think what people want to hear like over and over again is when am I going to be able to ride this train into Boston? OK. Um, the last thing is, and I've raised this before, the connections to the station from various areas of the city seems to me to be a problem. I live up on uh, Del Car Street, which is near St. Patrick's Cemetery mm -hmm. up in that area of Robeson. And what separates me from the waterfront and from the station are these hills. Okay? Yeah. Now, I would like to take commuter rail when I go down to Philadelphia a couple of days at a time or down to Manhattan for a couple of days at a time. So I'm no longer the typical commuter. It would be nice for me to get on the number four bus, go down to President Avenue, mm -hmm. and then get on some sort of a shuttle 
that would take me to this station. But now we have a central bus station that's located in a dense section of the city. The Lupatine Terminal? The Fall River Central Terminal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I don't, and, and we have a ferry service that operates yep. sometimes. But they all seem kind of disjointed and they don't really seem to be pulled together. Huh, okay. So um, I don't, I, I know that dealing with the bus people uh, is not maybe within your purview. Oh no, I have a great open conversations with Eric Russo all the time. Well, a, a year or so ago when they were talking about bus connections to the city, they said, well, essentially there will be none from the Highlands area. Well, I can't speak to that. I do know that that SRTA has spent a lot and of time I, studying their routes so they can serve the and station. I said at that time, I said, <clears throat> you know, it's, it sounds kind of ridiculous. Yeah. All you really need, and I think the city would benefit from it generally, is a way to get from Robeson and Highland Avenue yeah. down to the waterfront. Down to the waterfront. And right now, the, the typical the s s uh, bus system doesn't accomplish that. Well, I'll reach out to Eric on that one, and um, I, I'm glad you brought it up. I wouldn't have thought of it, but I do know that they um, secured funding to do extensive studying on their routes because the other problem with the SRTA service is it doesn't start very early. Yeah. And our first trains are going to be right. getting nurses right. to Boston. I, I brought that up the last night. So all you do is with number four is just add an early. Number day. four. Number four goes down Robeson Avenue. It's Robeson and what? Uh, it goes, it goes from Central Station yeah. all the way down to, I believe, uh, Wilson Road. Yeah, Wilson Road. Thereabouts. Road. Okay. And then comes back. I will ask him if where that is, and I'm glad you brought it up. Great. Thank you and very much. I Good appreciate, luck. and you'll be on this train, I promise. <laughs> Hi, my name is John Sandra from Fall River, and I was hoping to be attending the last meeting of this project, but it doesn't seem quite that way. Oh. I attended the first meeting in Fall, at the City of Fall River in, in, at City Hall 35 years ago. Yep. And I was hoping to use the train every day, but I'm retired now, so. I know. <laughs> but we're still working on it, and I appreciate everything every, everyone's done, and hopefully we'll be able to get on that ride. Yes, awesome. so so thank you for it. acknowledging that those 35 years, I feel your pain. I was mm. there too. I had done a brief period of time down in Washington, D.C., and I moved back up here yeah. because everyone said the train's coming. And, and the only thing <laughs> I'd like to say too is since this project started, there's been a lot of people with concerns about this and about that, and everyone's, if the MBTA works all over the state, why not South Coast? Yep. That's the only, my only question. That's right. It seems to be nitpicking about every little thing, but yet this isn't new. It works throughout the whole state, so why not here? Well, they, but, the other, the bottom line is they want to make sure it works well here too. Right. So that's, but, that's part of what. Thank you for the team and I hope to thank be on the you. train sometime. Thank you. Thank you. you. You can go up and recreate on the train. You don't have to get to work. <laughs> Ken. Hi, Gene. How are Hi. you? Hi. Good. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, coming down tonight. As you know, uh, we've been working on this project for a number of years, um, and I was hoping by now, you know, we'd be a little bit closer. But just a couple of things I'd like to uh, hopefully uh, clarify and also uh, comment upon. Um, with regard to earlier comments about the land being sold for a dollar on Duval Street, I think there was a small city piece of property that was part of that overall uh, real estate transaction, but the, the large majority of that transaction was privately held land, and it that was, was not sold. That was not sold for a yes, dollar. Thank I you. think it was actually an eminent domain proceeding. They maybe still litigated damages on that, but it was not sold for a dollar. And if the city did in fact sell their property for a dollar, I would gladly trade a dollar for a billion dollar investment anytime. Thank you. Um, secondly, uh, with regard to an earlier comment about uh, activity around the uh, platform on Duval Street, I think you know everyone should be aware, and maybe we're not doing a good enough job of getting the message out. But that land that's being created is, if you go down to Duval Street, we've removed the elevated highways and we're developing, we're in the process of master planning uh, 19 developable acres there that are probably going to accommodate more than 1,000 residential units as part of a TOD. And in addition to the residential units, you're also going to have restaurants, cafes, some office space, and some niche retail. So you're going to be essentially creating a whole new community down there based upon the centering foundational aspect of the commuter rail platform being there. So without that commuter rail platform, 
we probably wouldn't have as much interest in this uh, developable parcel of land. However, as I move forward in thinking this process through, I think one of the things we need to really be cognizant about is false deadlines, okay? Because what's hindering, uh, it's frustrating for us, uh, for myself in the economic development field, uh, for others in the business community, when we get deadlines that we're gonna be open up in July, yep. now we're gonna open up in December, we're gonna open up in the spring, we're gonna open up in the fall. We need to definitively determine when we are gonna open. We do. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. I know, I, I need November 1st, I need October 1st. I, I know, and, and- I need a definitive time frame. You, okay, yes. because- I get that. We're trying to, you know, we don't wanna have this project tarnished by this confusion. Right. Right? I think it's too big a project, it's too an important project for the city, and floating you know, schedules and false starts don't help anybody. Yeah. Um, in addition to that, I think you know, with regard to the assured bus uh, uh, aspect of things, I know that there will be uh, bus service to uh, the uh, facility on Duval Street, the platform on Duval Street. I think we just need to figure out how that's gonna work collectively and make sure that you don't necessarily have to go to the central station to get down there. So I think moving forward, we should all collectively work with Eric Russo from CERTA to try to nail that down and then get that information disseminated into the community way in advance. So again, it eliminates the uncertainty, it el eliminates the guesswork, and allows people to know what's happening, right? So yep. listen, in closing, I'd just like to say thank you. It's been a long time coming. Wow. It's been um, you know, many fits and starts, but I think we're here, and I think it's gonna have a very positive impact upon the community, so thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, and, and thank you for all your hard work. I think that, that Boulevard project's gonna be incredible. Is it four pedestrian access points that we're creating? Four, so that's gonna be helpful too. Thank you. Hi, Jean, Joe Frater. Hi. Town of Berkeley. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so some of the things that we're really concerned about is really the safety aspect of the trains. Uh, we've talked about educating the public through pamphlets, reaching out to schools, just to get to kids understand yeah. that you don't play on the tracks. On the MBTA side of the house, as far as egress areas to the track, mm -hmm. how often are those tracks inspected as far as the chain link fencing that's placed on there, and is that available for any public review at any time? That's an excellent question that I don't have an answer to, and I don't know if I'll, no. They, the engineers are actually the, the best inspectors because they're traveling that route all the time. So if there's a breach in a fence, which does happen, we've already had it during construction in several areas, right? People thought it'd be fun to break the fence down. Um, but the engineers will, will spot it, and then Keolis makes almost daily trips on their own. Um, we just had this conversation with some folks in New Bedford about their concerns, very similar to yours. Um, and then there's regular, like weekly inspections of certain things. So there's a real process that they engage in to make sure they're, that, that they're inspecting everything properly in a timely manner, and then they keep logs of it. Whether or not that's available to the public, I, I just don't know. Okay, uh, so my biggest concern was uh, engineers are in charge to ensure that they're visually checking tracks and, and doing their job. Uh, I imagine there's, a, of course, there's a process that the inspection is happening. Yes. I just wanted to make sure, uh, maybe who I can reach out to, to ensure or actually take a look at other communities' uh, safety uh, concerns, especially allowing uh, traffic to get onto those tracks. Yeah, y y your your primary concern is mostly the fencing and people. Correct. Yeah, and Correct. it's you're right. And we've put in, we've actually added fencing to our project from where we started. I don't know how many linear feet, but quite a few. Installing is good. Maintaining right. and ensuring that it's secure is two right. different aspects. No, it's totally true. Um, so I, if you wouldn't mind leaving your yep. information with I us. I will. We will contact railroad operations and we'll send you an email with details on exactly what they do because I wasn't paying full attention when they were, when they were in that part of the book. Um, but I do know they have a real process for that. So if you wouldn't mind just leaving me your information. I will, I will, Jean. Uh, I can get you that information. And we'll be looking for you to come to uh, the town of Berkeley again. I'll come Thank to you. Berkeley again. You guys love me so much. <laughs> Thank you.
Hi. 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 Welcome to Fall River. It's Thank a you. fantastic day. I love the trains come, but I can't wait to get on. I'm looking for a ticket. I want to be on the first train up to Boston. Um, there was a question about the cameras. You have cameras down there at the depot. We do. Who and who has access to those cameras? Does the Fall River Police Department have access to those? And they go directly to the MBTA, and the MBTA contacts Fall River Police. So now, with this Quick. graffiti being put up down there. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Why can't we have that addressed with all those cameras? Well, I think that's an excellent question. I'm not certain. I don't know what the resolution is on the cameras or things like that. But I mean, if there's cameras, they should be able to see. They should. They should. Pictures. I do know that some business owners on the other side of the station put up their own cameras because the bridges were getting tagged and right, the walls right, were getting right. tagged. It's a big problem that we nice have. Nice if we could get, uh, get that squared away. It was really nice. So, but the other thing you need to know is that we did put anti graffiti coatings on all these stations. Easy. That's only good for about three power washes. Okay, but my problem. next question is uh, the whistle. The whistle. Fall River doesn't have any cross tracks. No, you won't. So have that. really, won't have many whistles. You'll get the the jingling a ling of the bells when it's coming into the station. Okay, so the the, the, wi the whistle is for uh, I don't railroad crossings. It, it, mostly for grade crossings, and sometimes they'll blow it if they see something to, yeah. to give a warning. So they're allowed to do that in other areas. Oh, good. And we don't know what it's going to cost me to go up there yet. I don't and know how don't much it's going to cost you, but I'm is there one track coming into that station or two tracks? Into the Fall River Station? Yeah. It's one. One track. So the train's going to, after sleeping in a sonnet, it's going to wake no, up. No, it's sleeping in Fall River. River. It's not going to sleep in, in Fall River? <laughs> yeah. And we're going to get up there really early, early at 5.30? Yeah, right. something like that. All right. Sounds good. It does. Yeah. Let's make sure it is good. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We'll just take a couple more, unless in, and I'll stay here afterwards for folks. But um, I think I'm overwhelming you with my energy. I don't want to do that. <laughs> Please. Hi. Hey. Long time to see. I know. See. Um, Tom Lowney, resident of Fall River. Uh, been into the rail project from the get-go. Yes, you have. <laughs> and I uh, stop in to check on a few things. I hear disturbing things occasionally and don't see it cleared up. Uh, the original proposal was doing it in phases in the first phase. Was yep. to get the train down here period right. the second phase was supposed to add in additional stations and that was it wasn't sound it didn't sound like a rock hard but from what I'm hearing that the end station was supposed to be Battleship Cove as yep. a drop-off is that still in for the next phase or is so, that just a pipe dream again no you're talking about the full build which was the Stoughton alternative which was right. where we landed right and then that came in at such a high price tag and with so many wetland variances and other issues and complex structures that it looked like it would be years and years and years and years to get anything again. By building this extension of the Middleborough service, we're building out the whole Southern Triangle, that whole piece that goes like this to the two cities, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a fair chunk of the total track miles that would be needed for Stoughton Strait. Our focus right now is to get this built. Understand. Right? Congratulations, Battleship we're Cove. almost there. But <laughs> <laughs> no, Battleship Cove was pulled out of phase one because right. we were all about commuter rail and that was considered a seasonal station. Mm -hmm. um, Battleship Cove has great relevance and certainly would be part of what we would do going forward. We just haven't gotten there yet because this is the focus. Right, and understood. Is that still in the potential phase or is it being killed because I have... Well, no, we have we have said we've pro promoted several different scenarios of way, ways it could advance. It's just not going to happen quickly with the focus being on this, getting this done, right. making sure it's operating properly. Understood. But there are things you can do. We did we've done some early action projects, for example, in the end that were that had independent utility. We're still useful. Were part of the project, but didn't get the whole thing built because we didn't have three billion dollars. Right. And the Understood. problem with the Stoughton alternative is electric, and it's expensive. And so to do that, we have to, we have to be very thoughtful and mindful as we study that from an engineering perspective, that, right. that conceptual design, Understood. what that's going to look like. And we just haven't gone down that road okay. recently. So is the tracks were modified and set for that for the future all the way down to Ferry Street. Is that still? No. 
we stopped, we didn't do any more track beyond, um, beyond the depot. Okay. So, in, in the territory is still mass dot territory rail and transit. Right. So there is talk to do some more um, track work potentially all the way to gold medal, for example. But that wouldn't be commuter rail track, that would be freight. Okay. So another question I have for you is, is uh, bicycles. Bicycles? Are they allowed on this part of the, to be brought on board to take up into Boston? Yeah, there are certain trips you can do that on, I'm sure. I think the only time they frown on that is when they're standing room only. Right. Right? So, yeah, people take their bikes on the trains all the time. Just cannot ride them on the train. Oh, no. <laughs> I wouldn't <laughs> expect that. That'd be creative, but it's crazy. But um, just wanted to make sure that was still part of yeah. it. Yeah. Because, you know, the line is not always conducive throughout the uh, MBTA. No. Well, remember they have, if you take, if you want to go into Boston, there's the blue bikes, or I don't know what they're called now, but there's also those so in case you don't want to lug yours. Well, my son's in competition biking. So okay, never mind. You, you're lugging the bike. Yep. <laughs> okay. Thank you. No, thank you. And keep up the good work. And, and thank uh, you for coming. You have been quite the trooper over the years. <laughs> I'm just retiring here. I was hoping to be able to. I know. <laughs> Me know, too. It, it's the similar pain that you know, <laughs> yeah. if Rome was going to be built in a day, we would have hired a contractor, I know. Thank you. Thank Good you. Luck and God bless. Thanks. A follow-up. Hi, Gene. I have some comments I've got to say. Um, you know, there's a reason why, it seems to be lost in translation over here, there's a reason why New Bedford brought up the year 2019 is because they weren't part of the NBTA. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that's important is because if you're not in the NBTA, the NBTA cannot initiate eminent domain powers it doesn't have until that city or town is officially in it, which is why they brought it in. But the reason why I'm saying no. is that, Go ahead. is that, is that we just heard that the land wasn't purchased for a dollar and I don't care how much the project costs, the reason why New Bedford is fighting for it because they want the right dollar amount. And when you have public record showing that it was, it was for a dollar, I mean, you can't, Turn, turn away from that. So the thing is, is that you have to do right by the people and we're in the same boat. So just to see someone come in here and, and just lie in front of the, in front of the, the whole now, city I, I about the purchase that, price, I think I it's totally disingenuous. say nasty things about people because everyone yes. in this room it's is so, interested It's totally in the, disingenuous in the to say that because I come, I come with the facts, mm -hmm. I come with the paperwork. Okay. The city was the seller, mm -hmm. no one else. That's the only reason why I even came up to bring it up. Okay, and I appreciate that, so, and I told you I took notes on it. So, um, but I also know that Mr. Fiola. Uh, but he imagined, doing imminent, he imagined imminent domain. Yes. And in 2019, we wasn't in it. So, and, yeah, and that's but that, why. Yeah, you don't have to be in it for eminent domain. No, you do not. But, well, I know, but the reason why is that is the price is the price, and whatever's good to fight for is to be commended. But it was purchased for a dollar. Okay. Thank you for your comment. And this will be our last question. Or next to the last. <laughs> yeah, hello, Gene. Hi. <laughs> just, want, <coughs> just want to say I've been following the construction progress closely, been very impressed by the quality of the workmanship. I, I've seen the, uh, uh, I'm particularly impressed with the changes up at, uh, up at Murex. Mm -hmm. you know, and I followed closely the, uh, uh, the construction of the layover uh, area here in Fall, uh, Airman Fall River. Mm -hmm. um, regarding some of the trespassing issues, I do recall before construction was started, seeing kids in dirt bikes yeah. run up and down the, the right of way. Um, I had a friend who used to live on uh, North Main Street, uh, within sight of the right of way, and I've seen more than once dirt bikes buzzing up and down uh, that. And I noticed now it's fully fenced along, <coughs> uh, along that uh, uh, stretch. I'm glad to hear that there's at least still some uh, thought on the, the phase two uh, construction further down the. Uh, uh, yep. Down the down the road, I know electrification is not cheap. It would, I, I've heard I've heard the, old, the whole MBTA further down the road is considering electrifying everything. Yeah, it, but we need a grid for that. So right, there's so right, many right, things. Right, yeah. right, right. Uh, it, it's more you know uh, again the not, not so much, not much the rolling stock expenditures is more the uh, the infrastructure expenditures, you know, exactly. catenary and substations exactly. and, uh, yeah. um, uh, and everything else. But like I said, I've been impressed by what I've seen of the construction quality. Uh, so far, looking forward to when you not actually announce uh, uh, service. Does the MBTA still have that $10 uh, pa uh, pass on the weekends? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, because that, that's one I, thing. I if they if they do have, oh yeah, I've I've written uh, several times under that, and yeah, that's a uh, uh, that's a very nice uh, way to you know go to Boston on a weekend. Uh, it certainly uh, is. Uh, yeah. Trip. You know, I'm not commuting anymore, but you know, I will testify. Route 24 can be a horror show. Uh, pa really? <laughs> past exper uh, uh, experience. So definitely looking forward to seeing the seeing the introduction of service. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your comments too. Hello, my name is um, Carlos Cesar. I believe we had spoke before. We have. I think at the last meeting that I mentioned to you and you will remember our conversation that I said that this is a Boston train, not a Fall River train. Yes. You remember that conversation. Well, I think my, um, I still have the same opinion. Mm -hmm. The pros and cons, everybody's talking about the pros. Where's the cons? I'd like to know a few. Do you have a few? No, I uh, not okay. I will, I will uh, uh, mention. It. I will mention a few. Here's the thing: Fall River, it's ready for the train. We have the beautiful apartments with marble counters, beautiful elevators. At the cost of people, they cannot live in Fall River now. They have to move out because they cannot afford to live in Fall River. Um, I think that's that's a, a that's a big a big problem. Hour and a half drive. Uh, I drive to Boston. Take me an hour and a half. I guess gonna take me the same time by train. And I prefer to get there, have a car, and I use Uber or bus. I have my own car to drive around. Okay. So that's that's another thing that I I don't think that that will work for me. Um, why is a Boston train? Because I don't think we have enough students going and filling up a train to Boston every day. But we will have a lot of people trying to save money and live cheaper in here, so coming from Boston. So pr you probably will have more full trains coming from Boston to Fall River than from Fall River residents using the train for Boston. Okay. That's, you know, I just hope that five years from now, with now the train's gonna save Fall River from everything that's going on. It's gonna, it's a lifesaver. The train's gonna save Fall River. I just hope that five years from now, the train's still working with a few people riding on. So after all this investment. So I don't, People, people can use it. People are free to use it. I just don't think that we have enough people to ride the train to make it, and then the price is going to rise. So no, you know, the, the it's public transportation, which is subsidized. That's what it is. Um, so one is going to pay for, for for another. But here's my thing. Yeah. Things have to move forward. Mm -hmm. they have to improve. And you know, new things come along, and one of the things is, is is the train. But I just want people to know that's at the cost of other people. When one person wins, another person loses, and everything. And I think that's that's something coming well, with the train. And we we've been feeling already the effects of the train without the train being here yet. So that's well. I appreciate your comments, and thank you for. For Thank you. your sharing your opinions, um, we do. Uh, we're we're confident. We did the studies on ridership, which is a big black box of variables. You throw everything in, and we get riders coming out of it. So we that's why we had to order new coaches because we needed the the capability to carry those people. And we also did analysis of what transit-oriented development would look like uh, in the city and throughout the corridor. So. We did, and we did the, the feeder bus analysis. We did a lot of studies to make sure that when this train, when we hit the go switch to go to Boston from Fall River, we're ready to go, and that the city is ready to accommodate that. And the city, I think, and the mayor's not here anymore, but he's been a, a true supporter, as has Ken Fiola, of making sure that the city of Fall River is positioned to take advantage of the benefits the train, that link the train will give us that we haven't had in 65 years. Um, so with that, I'm going to have Nancy close us out. <laughs> oh, yeah, <of> <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
Thank you so much. I want you to know I started working on this project in 2017. So, no, I'm sorry, 2007, Seven. 2007. So believe me, when there is a date available, we will really look forward to sharing it with everybody. And um, we're plugging away. We have you in mind every day, believe me, um, because we know how much uh, we believe that the train is gonna make a great deal for the region. So thank you all for coming. Please look again at the um, safety materials. If you want us to come to your community, school, church, library, please let us know, send us an email, um, and we'll really be happy to come and share a lot of information. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your evening.